musical linguistic objects. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon, and today is day 46 of Occupy Wall Street. And to begin with, I would like to thank the following saloners who have sent in donations to help with the expenses here in the salon by either sending in a direct donation or by paying for a copy of the Pay What You Can audiobook edition of my novel, The Genesis Generation. And these kind souls are fellow author Julie Kay, Nexus 112, who is not only a saloner but is also an important contributor to several of the Dope Tribes projects, and regular monthly donor Mark C., so, thank you one and all, and uh, that also goes out to uh, all of our fellow saloners who are telling their friends about the salon and helping to further the global discussion about psychedelic consciousness in many other ways. It's really great for me to feel so much love and friendship from all of you. Uh, it means a lot to me, and uh, it's what keeps me going each week. So, now we'll uh, pick up where we left off in the previous podcast and join Terrence McKenna for the question and answer session that took place right after the talk that we heard in the last program. And while it may at first sound as if he's actually speaking about the current Occupy movement, uh, what he actually had in mind at the time was the public face of the psychedelic community, which of course today is part of the 99%. And so it seems that some of his ideas back in 1987, when this talk was given, are still quite relevant yet today. So, let's join Terence McKenna for a little clarification of the ideas that he spoke of in my last podcast. Oh, and uh, just a little heads up, in about five minutes you're going to hear Terence say something about uh, psychotherapy involving Adam. Uh, and that's not a person. Uh, just to remind you, Adam was the code name for MDMA, or ecstasy, back in the 80s. Even at Ground Zero in Dallas, we called it Adam as often as we called it X. Leary and the whole episode in the 1960s proved it can't succeed if it's waged as a mass movement. It's a hell of a party. <laughs> but it doesn't in the end. You have to, uh, you have to get science. You have to subvert it in some way. I assume the front door is locked. You have to subvert science in some way. And my, I have studied science from the point of view of a man with a catapult searching the walls of a great keep for its point of weakness. And I think, dear friends, that psychology is the place to put the pressure on. You see, around the turn of the century, uh, science was really erecting its tent, and you had uh, the phrenologists, those were the people who felt the bumps on your head and said whether you had criminal tendencies or not. You had palmistry, you had a, a number of the, uh, homeopathy is a good example, you had a number, and psychology, psychologists recall were called alienists in the pre-Freudian period. And all of these uh, theories about human types were in furious competition to get themselves declared a science because they sensed that otherwise you were reduced to quackery. Well, the phrenologists couldn't bring it off. <laughs> My impression is the homeopathists only convinced themselves. <laughs> the palmists convinced not a great number of people, but the psychologists actually brought it off. And uh, around the mumbo-jumbo of Freudian analysis, they were able to claim that they had a science that uh, described what was going on with human beings. The truth is, I believe, that psychology though well-meaning, I mean, I don't cast aspersions on their intentions, but I think its uh, effectiveness is close to zero. It depends entirely on the personality of the therapist. Reichian, Freudian, uh, Jungian, you name it. 
30% get better, 30% get worse, and 30% stay the same. What this means is that the theories are no good. It's just the people are either good, bad, or indifferent. One in three, you see. So psychology is needs tools. Psychology needs uh, ways into the psyche beyond uh, what it has previously had available. And I think most psychologists, psychiatrists who thought about this understand that drugs are the way to do it. That you, you, the way you study the atom is you smash it and then you pick up the pieces and weigh them and calculate their trajectories and all this. The way you study the psyche should be by perturbing it. You know, you cannot figure out what's going on with a pond of still water unless you drop a rock into it and then you see waves move out and you say, oh my gosh, it's a fluid medium. It has a shifting refractive index. It has all these properties. This is a reasonable strategy for understanding anything. And, and uh, the fascination with shamanism is, I think, the sign that psychology is willing to own up to the fact that it is desperate for new insights into human dynamics. So I am hopeful that we can arrest the attention of psychologists and get them looking at shamanism, all of shamanism, even the parts which are perhaps less effective than the intoxicating and hallucinogenic plants, but studying how sound drives imagery and how uh, certain kinds of linguistic expectations lead to certain kinds of results. And so this garden in Hawaii, which will appeal, as I say, to chemists and taxonomists and botanists. But these are established sciences with established methods which will simply inculcate us into their uh, triumphal forward march. But there is actually a possibility of revisioning psychology, of changing it. Uh, uh, the, one of the great things, I think, about uh, the recent uh, flap about Adam was that unnoticed in all the shilly-shallying that went back was a, a new paradigm actually was introduced into the practice of psychotherapy, a paradigm that has been absent for thousands of years. It was the notion that the doctor takes the drug. <laughs> in some cases, you know, that has been absent. There is no concept of that in Western medicine. That really is a new paradigm. So uh, what a garden such as I'm describing would do in Hawaii is it would simply lower the energy barriers, make it easier for these uh, professionals to explore these areas which otherwise uh, might be closed to them for institutional or financial reasons. So, so uh, you haven't heard of the cultural survival? No, I haven't heard of them. Oh, it's uh, an attempt to uh, save a lot of these uh, pre-literate uh, cultures in, in situation. Uh, like uh, their present project is to try to keep uh, Huicholi culture alive, although it's, uh, they're being uh, exploited for this cheap labor and so on, and being taken off the reservation. Um, well, see, I, I'm ambivalent about that. I mean, I think it's a very strange kind of cultural chauvinism which goes to somebody else and says, you know, you're a museum piece, and we're going to give you a 500,000-acre reserve, and we're not going to let anybody bring metal or transistor radio so that your wonderful culture can be preserved. I think that what has to be preserved is the knowledge you know, because it's impossible to stop the forward march of information. I mean, it is, even today when you go to the Amazon, you go miles and miles and miles up these rivers, and the people are hardly wearing any clothes, and there's only one motorboat on the river, and it's, they've never seen an automobile, but everybody's carrying transistor radios, and can get the London fix on gold at a the <laughs> switch. You know, and how do you stop it? The, it permeates everything. So rather than try to halt the inevitable globalization of electronic culture, I think we should furiously try to preserve 
the information and interview everybody and then uh, do what we can with it. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of cultural <coughs> shamanism. Well, I'm not sure if all cultures want to be assimilated, really. Well, but what culture ever got to vote in the past? <laughs> you know, it's a problem. I agree because I am not enamored of this culture. I think it's tremendously dynamic. I think it is uh, uh, a transitional to a culture of star flight and psychological depth. But you know, this is the chaos at the end of history. This is the accumulation of ten thousand years of muddling through with progressively, you know, we are deep in the woods at this point. And the proof of that is the fact that our religion, which has, is science, has bequeathed to us our arsenal of hydrogen weapons. I mean, our religion has betrayed us into the valley of dry bones that T.S. Eliot anticipated in the wasteland. It, it, the well has gone dry. And what we do about this, I'm not sure. But I, I have said, sitting in this chair, that what the 20th century is about is an effort to recover our origins. That in the same way that uh, uh, the Renaissance steadied itself in the face of the inevitability of modern times was by harking back to Greek and Rome and translating Plato and the dramatists and, and trying to realize the ideals of Greek aesthetics and Roman law, what we are trying to do in the 20th century is realize the meaning of a... because our culture crisis is so much deeper, where we are casting back to is 20, 30,000 years into the past. This is why Freud and Auschwitz and modern art and rock and roll, and sexual permissiveness, and drug taking, and all of these things. We are trying to understand and, and culturally revivify in a modern context that time of origins. And uh, it's real rocky. We don't know how all this is going to come out, because we, there's so much we don't know about the constraints on the situation. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you know, or anyone here may know, what uh, Larry and Lily uh, refer to as Biden Kate. Is that a common plant or something? That no, no, made? that's an entirely synthetic compound that is an anesthetic in ordinary medical usage, but that in sub-anesthetic doses, is a mind-altering drug. I'm not sure I would call it a psychedelic, but, you know, one man's psychedelic is another man's... Uh, do you know what it is, or what... Uh, it's ketamine. I mean, it's rela ketamine, it's related to PCP, it's a, an anesthetic. Oh, they take that? <laughs> <laughs> Different strokes! <laughs> yeah. Terrence, uh, that, uh... Trivializing it, it sounds to me what you've got is a real good candidate for the big black thing in 2001. Um, but yes. um, one, one problem I have, though, is that, um, you, as you said, you're taking off from uh, orthodox um, evolutionary biology. And I may be wrong about this, but one of my impressions of that viewpoint is, one of the assumptions of that viewpoint, is a denial of the phenomenon of consciousness in non-human species. Um, and 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 I, so I'm not sure how your your um, theory would relate to, for example, uh, dolphin intelligence or speculating free consciousness or, or any lo things along those lines. Well, now let's see if I understand you right. Uh, uh, consciousness is a very difficult thing to recognize. And dolphin consciousness, tree consciousness, these things are for dolphins and trees. The, it's very, very hard to bridge the gap between the species. I mean, I think the task of finding the extraterrestrial is not so much... Uh, it's a task of recognizing it when you find it, you know. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it's necessary that the mushroom be an extraterrestrial intelligence for all of this to have happened. If psilocybin only increases visual acuity, it could have given sufficient dominance 
to this pack hunting primate adaptation as opposed to the root eating gorilla type adaptation to give it dominance. And then I think a plus for the theory and the kicker is this weird thing which it does to language and the fact that another pressure on developing language is this pack hunting lifestyle. So to my mind, <clears throat> it all falls together so neatly that it has a certain kind of logical momentum. But you're very right and it's important when re talking about evolution to remember that the cardinal dictum of Darwinian mechanics is that there is no teleology. That means evolution is not moving toward something. All notion of purpose has to be given up. It isn't that things evolve or move toward higher forms. It's just that things complexify. And this complexification gives rise to what we define as higher forms. Uh, no, the voice of the mushroom, the question of the mushroom as an intellect key grows, to my mind, murkier every day. I mean, I used to firmly believe it was simply an extraterrestrial and that we were going to have to come to terms with the fact that in the ecology of this planet there was another minded species, but that it was just so different from us that the task was to cognize it and that it in fact had probably been intelligent and on this planet longer than we had. And then I came, I was willing at one time to entertain a sort of Jungian, you know, it's the, it's the oversoul, the collective unconscious or personified as a psychopompic archetype which teaches. But you know, this is like conjuring. This doesn't explain anything. This is just a, a, some kind of stream of gobbledygook. I mean, it, Jung talks about autonomous psychic complexes which have escaped the control of the ego. That's what he means. He means an elf, you see. <laughs> but, but, but when you call it this, an autonomous psychic complex, then it somehow be, oh, of course, how oh, pedestrian. <laughs> It's not pedestrian at all. Well, I was being playful with the 2001 reference, but uh, the actual question is that um, dolphins, as an example, in, in my view, have demonstrable intelligence and have something approaching culture. Um, do you think they had their own mushroom? Or, or, no, or, or, I, I, not, I, I, or, or is that, that, in fact, uh, not necessary to the development of that type of intelligence? No, I don't, I don't think it is necessary. First of all, I'm not sure they're intelligent. If they are, uh, there's ample spans of time. I mean, they were land animals, and then they went back to the sea, and it's really hard to realize how much time there has been for these, for these changes to go on. As to culture, culture is sort of a shock wave which follows behind language. Language uh, or culture is fossilized language. And, and one of the reasons that I think these psychedelic compounds still are important is because they catalyze the evolution of language. And that very directly uh, issues into a catalysis of culture. I see the whole world we're living in as basically the legacy of LSD. What it did to language in the 1960s is now visible as culture in the 1980s. You see, we don't realize that when you don't have language, you have instead reality. And that when you take a piece of reality and put a word to it, this is like a process of fossilization. The original thing is completely dissolved away and mimicking it and left in its place is a, a, a template of it, a pseudomorph of the original thing. Well, first you have a word for one thing and then you have a word for another thing and pretty soon, like a coral creature, you have completely erected a symbolic reality. It stretches from the moment of the Big Bang to the heat death of the universe. You can explain everything, but like this explanation has somehow precluded any kind of involvement with it. And we're living inside this. It, what is real is not the walls, the streets, the buildings, and the electrical wiring. What is real are the linguistic structures which allow such things to come into existence. And I think that uh, 
these psychedelic compounds, these psychedelic plants, catalyze language. This is why it, before history or before modern history, the shaman was always connected with the notion of poetics. It was realized that what, what real shamanism is in the aesthetic uh, expression of it, not the curing expression of it. What shamanism was, was language work. Stretching the envelope, isn't that what engineers call it when they design a plane which can go a certain speed and then they go one mile faster? This is what the shaman tries to do. He tries to stretch the envelope of the linguistic context and over thousands and thousands of years of doing this, you arrive where we are. You know, we have the legacy and science is certainly an expression of the shamanic uh, thing. I mean, the, the dreams of the alchemists of the 16th century have been entirely realized in the technical accomplishments of the 20th century. I mean, we do convert base metals to gold. We do, uh, you know, create diamonds out of ashes and, uh, and all of these things. But it turns out it wasn't the literalizing of these things that was so illuminating and inspiring to our humanness. It was the creation of the linguistic models. Then it became trivial when someone actually did it. That's like a misunderstanding, <laughs> you know. One, one more um, short one. Uh, what's, your, what's the time frame on this? There's a couple of three million years between the uh, uh, first upright walking you know, yes, bands right, and the right. You have the cattle. original aridity three million years ago, and then you have the growth of the grasslands. Really, you don't have a, a lot happening until 10,000 years ago. That's where we begin to see that all the elements are in place and that this has probably been going on for a long, long time. This is post-Neanderthal. Basically, yes, very recent. In the, uh, did I mention that in the Tesseli Tesseli Plateau of southern Algeria, there are cave paintings which have never been commented upon, so far as I'm aware, by any orthodox anthropologist, which clearly show human beings dancing, holding mushrooms in their hand, racing in a kind of round dance in one case, and then in another. Uh, instance, a single human figure wearing a kind of bone apron and with mushrooms sprouting out of the body and with mushrooms clutched in the hands. And this is, this is the earliest and only evidence of mushroom use that we have from Africa, but it's very, uh, very conclusive. The massive growth in brain size has occurred over the past 30,000 years. In other words, within the time frame when all of these elements would have been present uh, on the African belt. And I, I've sketched this very quickly because, first of all, you're not professionally interested in the details of, of uh, evolution of ecosystems, but for instance, Carl Sauer has argued that there is no such thing as a natural grassland, that grasslands are the earliest artifact of human existence on this planet, and that we created them with fire and repeated yearly burning because uh, yearly fires promoted the growth and rapid evolutionary selection of grasses which promoted the production of cereals. And uh, the proof of this contention is pretty easy to understand and hard to overthrow. And it is simply this, that if you have a grassland which abuts a virgin forest, you go into the forest and you find that none of the grassland species none of the newly evolved grassland species are present in the forest, but in the grassland, many of the forest species are found to have adapted forms which are living in the grassland. Well, that's a very, very clear proof that the grasslands are recent and worse successive upon the forest. So this is another context. Perhaps humans were the agency which created this entire environment where this ungulate, evolution of ungulate animals and pack hunting and all of this could have evolved. The impact of human beings on the planet, there was just a conference about six months ago in Boston in which uh, paleontologists 
of the mammalian paleontologists gathered together and pretty much concluded that the major force promoting the extinction of the large mammals all over the world was man. You know, and up to that, the Irish elk, the ontodoth, uh, the, the huge pigs which were seven feet high at the shoulder, the giant armadillo, the 14 foot high ground sloth. All of these creatures disappeared because of human agency. It wasn't, as had previously been thought, that their size uh, caused them place such uh, constraints on their food gathering ability that they became extinct. No, it was that they were hunted out of existence. Phil, there's a parallel point I think is important to bring up. You were talking to your brother about the occurrence of tryptamines in the Middle East because of some of our recent experiments. And one thing I think that should be added is throughout the Middle East there are tryptamine containing plants and beta carbon containing plants. The beta carbon containing plants would make the visions much more stronger of any mushroom or the tryptamines. And these are found in ancient agricultural sites and in and found in folk medicine. I, in fact, I was unaware that there were tryptamine containing plants in the Middle East until I talked to your brother. Yes, I, I simplified the story and I concentrated on Africa because Africa is thought to be the point of origin where all this hominoid speciation went on, but you're correct, there could be <coughs> other plants which could synergize this, or in the new world you, <coughs> you have a completely different situation where different plants, Banisteriopsis copy, or morning glories, or peyote, uh, or the uh, other psilocybin-containing mushrooms, would have worked the same kinds of effects on culture, but you don't have quite the coincidence of events or, or of factors necessary for the kind of scenario I've sketched out. You need the grasslands, you need the pack hunting style of life, and, uh, and uh, these other psychedelic plants are not subject to being associated with the domestication situation. For instance, Banisteriopsis coffee is a wild, a rare wild woody vine, and the admixture plants are, are similar. Only in the case of the ergot, well, no, there, there are three cases. The ergot, the coprophytic mushrooms, and then, of course, hemp is another one. I mean, we cannot, there's no telling how long hemp, cannabis, has been under domestication because we find hemp and mats that are you know, 45,000 years old, that it was being twisted into skeins, and the seeds are found in fire pits. So, uh, again, this is an example of one of these things being brought in. Yeah. Somebody back there? Yes. Yeah, um, regarding hallucinogens and how people have used them, to me there's a difference between a hallucinogen stimulating something in the brain and the brain actually evolving and it's stimulating something in people that is manifested through the culture. And I wonder if uh, in the last 20 years or so, since at least a few million people have started taking hallucinogens, any real evidence has come out that there is measurable increase in intelligence or any other skills besides this visual acuity of human beings who have taken any of a number of hallucinogens or mind-altering drugs. Well, an evolutionary biologist would say there just hasn't been time and that's a reasonable answer, but you know, if you go down to Silicon Valley to these software writing places or anywhere where technology is on the cutting edge, I mean, all these guys have ponytails down to their ass and it's very clear that they are heads, that heads are in charge of designing the cutting edge of culture. And I don't know whether that means there's been an evolution in intelligence or not, but uh, you've got to take seriously, and it's too bad that it wasn't taken seriously, the notion that what these things do is they are consciousness expanding compounds. Well, that's we got to have more consciousness. That's what we're short of at every level, uh, especially the managerial and control level. So if these things actually expand consciousness, then we should be going full bore to find out what this is all about, because it is our stupidity which is holding us back. 
it is we are amazingly lumpen and uh, humanity is just unbelievably perversely locked in in closed loops of behavior patterns and self-deception and all of this and in fact where you have an outbreak of mass psychedelia such as LSD there you get people abandoning fixed behavior patterns and the stockbroker sells his house and this sort of thing uh, they decondition and this is a precondition for consciousness how can you evolve your consciousness if you do not decondition yourself from the mold into which it has been poured and ossified they liquefy it's almost like the alchemical metaphor of the solucio you know it everything is dissolved and then everything is recrystallized in a new form but consciousness expansion must loom large in the history of the species i see all of history as a psychedelic trip if by psychedelic trip we mean an experience of consciousness expansion that ascends through successive levels i mean this we have become this is a trip which has lasted 1500 generations and we are not the same people who began it I mean, they were all sitting around scratching and picking fleas. We have carried through the legacy because of the ability to epigenetically encode information so that the experience of each generation could be saved and passed on in the form of records of some sort to the next generation. We have amassed a vast amount of consciously expressed material the problem is we're not making good use of it i mean in a microcosm i think it was william james who said it's fine that we line our rooms with books but if we don't read those books we're no better off than our cats and dogs and this is sort of what the psychedelic experience is an invitation to it's an invitation to read the akashic records the real books, the books that have accumulated in hyperspace out of the blood, sweat, and tears of 1,500 generations of explorers. We are the inheritors of that legacy. They have carried us from monkeyhood to within 15 or 20 years of star flight, machine intelligence, genetic immortality, so forth and so on it would be a great pity if we were to drop the ball and i think uh, the blame would accrue rather directly upon us we owe a debt to those people the only way that the conquests the pillaging the the uh, dispersions of people the pogroms the only way the horror of history can be redeemed is by giving history a meaning you know and the meaning has to somehow be commiserate with the toil and the suffering that was required to produce the situation where that meaning could be generated so every successive generation of human beings has had this uh, incrementally increasing responsibility and an incrementally increasing set of tools for righteously shouldering that responsibility and this is our situation it's simply that we are either the penultimate or the ultimate generation you know there's an irish prayer may you be alive at the end of the world and meaning may you be a part of the transformation of transformations which gives everything meaning and i really believe it isn't going to go on for centuries people we aren't going to put standard stations on planets around alpha centura and we aren't <laughs> going to export tylenol to the stars it isn't like that it is accelerating at so rapid a rate that we are going to become unrecognizable to ourselves within the lifetimes of most people living in this room so how do you come to terms with that 
And how do you help everybody else come to terms with that? This is, I think, the dilemma of all of our lives. And, you know, I've chosen to respond to it by centering in on these, uh, the, the hallucinogenic, ecstatic experience. I couldn't have done otherwise. It seems to me obvious, but I suppose to Hitler, National Socialism seemed the obvious solution. So I'm not saying follow me, I'm saying we all have to respond in some way to this legacy, this responsibility, and this challenge. And if, if there is anything on this earth which expands consciousness, it should be fully and exhaustively explored without cultural bias, without fear or prejudice. And talks like this, people like yourselves, we are you know, a small, thin voice in the wind, but it has to be said because uh, it seems to be right. Yeah. Then why are you going to do this under the reach of American jurisdiction? You mean, why not do it in another country? Well, why not do it under American jurisdiction? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, I mean, we're not discussing anything illegal, are we? <laughs> what are we discussing? <laughs> I, I'm advocating that all these ethnomedically uh, uh, significant plants need to be preserved so that professionals will have an opportunity to sort through them. The issue of consciousness expansion is just like in the issue of your sexual conduct. It's nobody's business. I mean, surely your mind must be the most private part of your body, and it should be treated as such. So on one level, I'm talking about almost political and societal programs. Let's preserve plants. Let's preserve folklore for professionals. But there are no professionals in the field of self-exploration. That's everybody's job. I mean, you all are PhDs in consciousness exploration, or if you're not, you should be, because uh, what else have you got going? You know? <laughs> yes. I was thinking myself about the legality of keeping your garden or just keeping its products. Are you going to differentiate between uh, mushrooms that are not uh, legal to have or, or give or sell? Or? Yes, no, I'm not really, uh, we wrote a book years ago on the cultivation of mushrooms, and I consider that work pretty much finished. And I'm much more concerned about these very obscure plants, higher plants, you know, not fungi, but higher... They haven't made illegal yet. No, they're not illegal, they're virtually unknown to science. I mean, what we're talking about is tracking down rumors and uh, that sort of thing. No, it's not necessary to break any laws to explore the fringes of psychobotany. Uh, laws only are passed against drugs in response to uh, epidemic outbreaks of usage. The compounds I'm interested in are totally unavailable and no one's ever heard of them anyway. And that's where the interest lies. I mean, I certainly wish that it were legally possible for professionals to do research on the effects of all psychedelic drugs in the, in the context of medical research. But apparently this is not to be. And so this is then a different approach, saying, okay, we are not asking to be that something which is illegal be declared legal, or that something which is illegal be uh, exceptions be made for researchers. I think this is fruitless. I think the Adam thing proved that. I mean, I, I think Adam was extremely uh, efficacious for therapy. I think the case for its use in therapy was brilliantly made. I think the people who made the case were extremely sincere. And I think that they just got kicked all over the board because they didn't realize that sincerity doesn't count and uh, it's not about making a reasonable case to reasonable people. You're going up against uh, a, a much more draconian kind
kind of thing. So no, I'm advocating an exploration of the botanical and ethnomedical fringes, and it, it doesn't involve any kind of legal issues uh, at all in the present context. It's, it's perfectly reasonable to go forward, and I think this is the way to do it, you know. Any other points? Yes. Yeah, I thought you'd, uh, briefly relating to your last point, I thought you were doing some experimentation with uh, a boga root, which containing ibogaine happens to be illegal. No, um, I'm, I've never experienced ibogaine. I'm very interested in it. Of course, if I ever did it, I would go to Gabon, where it's not only legal, but a tradition. But that wasn't one of the plants I, I have in mind. It would certainly be interesting. I know it's being used uh, in studies of inhibiting heroin addiction and this kind of thing. But there are a number. Our, my focus of interest over the years has been the Amazon basin. And uh, I think that that's uh, probably where the focus will be, just sort of by default. Yes, one of the interesting <laughs> things, when Watson tried to show that... Uh, that Soma was Amanita muscaria, he ignored this very rich set of associations uh, that the Hindus have to cattle. Um, I think that probably uh, Soma was not Amanita muscaria, but it was Strepharia cubensis. The interesting thing about Soma, the god, because it is also a god as well as an intoxicant, was that it was a male lunar deity and throughout the world the moon is almost universally associated with the feminine I, I believe in there's a North American Indian tradition that associates the moon with masculinity but in this Soma tradition you get a masculine lunar figure and then in Mesopotamia in the in the god Nanar or Sin there is also a male lunar deity he is uh, um, the, the lunar goddess Sibyl is actually his daughter. He represents an earlier stratum of mythological material. So yes, one of the unsolved mysteries of ethnomedicine, which if anybody's looking for a project, is to go to India and try and find out exactly what the status of mushrooms is in India now and in prehistory. Hinduism was reformed quite radically a few centuries ago by the introduction of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata specifically forbids eating mushrooms to high caste Brahmins. There is, in other words, a mycophobia there. And one of the puzzles of Wasson's theory of Soma, or anybody's theory of Soma for that matter, is if it was so wonderful and when you read the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda, it is clearly wonderful. If it was so wonderful, then how could they have ever lost it? And I think the answer is probably it, it occurred through a series of stages. Originally, it was the orgiastic intoxicant of a general tribal group. Then, over time, it became the secret property of a priest class, and knowledge of it was much more restricted. And then there was a uh, popular rebellion against the priestly hierarchy, and the priests and everything associated with them was swept away, and the mushroom went with it. This is the only scenario I can imagine where a psychedelic drug could actually be lost to, to a culture, other than massive disruption in contact with another culture. But it's very interesting. There is an, there are an aboriginal people in India, people not of the Indo-Aryan stock or even of the Dravidian stock, but tribal people in, uh, in uh, Orissa and Bengal called the Santal. And they have, uh, unlike the Orthodox Hindus, they have a tremendously rich mushroom vocabulary. They have hundreds of words for mushrooms. They recognize 50 species with common names. They eat 12 species. They are, in other words, they appear to represent a, uh, a uh, 
mycophilic culture that was extant in India before the Indo-Aryan invasions. And their relationship to psychedelic mushrooms has uh, never been fully explored. They have a very interesting language where every everything is designated male or female. Everything is given this designation except one thing in the entire universe, and it happens to be a mushroom. You're listening to The Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. And so, uh, since I know that we have quite a few anthropologists among us here in the salon, uh, Maybe those last 10 minutes or so uh, may have given you several ideas about areas of research that you might be interested in pursuing. Of course, uh, (laughs) getting a grant to study ancient psychedelic cultures right now uh, may be a little hard to come by, but I'm sure that if you become passionate enough about finding the truth out about Soma that, well, you'll find a way to do the research, I'm sure. So, uh, did you hear anything new from the Bard McKenna this time? Uh, Well, I did, uh, although he may have said it before. This is the first time I remember him uh, saying so clearly that his ideas about mushroom consciousness or mushroom intelligence had been changing from his original position of thinking that they were definitely extraterrestrials to a very different take on how they actually fit into the picture of life here on the planet Earth. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, later on he revisited the extraterrestrial idea about the mushroom, uh, at least uh, when it fit the point he was trying to make. But uh, right now I'm not here to quibble with Terence about the ultimate origin of mushroom spores. Rather, uh, I'm more interested in what I heard just now as a call to arms. Do you remember the part that I'm talking about? Uh, Well, better yet, uh, let me just repeat it for you right now. You know, there's an Irish prayer, may you be alive at the end of the world, and meaning may you be a part of the transformation of transformations, which gives everything meaning. And I really believe it isn't going to go on for centuries, people. We aren't going to put standard stations on planets around Alpha Centura, and we aren't <laughs> going to export Tylenol to the stars. It isn't like that. It is accelerating at so rapid a rate that we are going to become unrecognizable to ourselves within the lifetimes of most people living in this room. So how do you come to terms with that, and how do you help everybody else come to terms with that? This is, I think, the dilemma of all of our lives, and you know, I've chosen to respond to it by centering in on these... Uh, the the hallucinogenic, ecstatic experience. I couldn't have done otherwise. It seems to me obvious, but I suppose to Hitler, National Socialism seemed the obvious solution. So I'm not saying follow me. I'm saying we all have to respond in some way to this legacy, this responsibility, and this challenge and if if there is anything on this earth which expands consciousness, it should be fully and exhaustively explored without cultural bias, without fear or prejudice. And talks like this, people like yourselves, we are, you know, a small, thin voice in the wind, but it has to be said because uh, it seems to be right. We all have to respond in some way, so says the Bard McKenna. Little did he know at the time, uh, the time he said those words back in 1987, that you and I would be hearing his call today on the 46th day of Occupy Wall Street. As I mentioned in my last podcast, each week now I'll be ending these programs with some news and thoughts from the Occupy movement that has now spread all over the planet. And at the end of this program, I'm going to play a clip from a Michael Moore speech at Occupy San Francisco the other day. And in it, he points out that although this movement is only six weeks old, it already has the support of over half the U.S. population, according to a recent poll. And uh, what's so astounding about that, you ask? Well, uh, during the 60s, the anti-war protests went on for over five years or so before gaining that amount of national support. 
As the song goes, there's something happening here. Now, I've been spending a significant amount of time lately watching the live video streams of the Occupy demonstrations and conversing in their associated chat rooms. And I highly recommend that you do the same or at least take a little tour of this movement by going to either or both Livestream.com uh, or uh, Ustream.com or both, better yet, and just enter the word Occupy in their search boxes. That'll uh, bring up a listing of all the cities around the world that are feeding the video record of their occupations, demonstrations, and marches into these sites, where they're uh, not only available as live video feeds, but where much of this video is also recorded and available for you to go back and see for yourself what actually happened, uh, without having to depend on your local corporate media to distort the truth for you. And the people at these demonstrations, by the way, are just like you and me. Uh, here's a short bit that I recorded from Occupy Detroit this weekend. The thing about Occupy Wall Street is that Occupy Wall Street is really a coalition of a whole bunch of active, um, 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 activism groups. Um, how, how, how I got involved is that I just basically felt like this is the time. This is the this is the this is the watershed moment uh, 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 where. Um, so many people at the same time are just feeling the same way and they just fed up. So um, what Occupy Wall Street allowed us to do is that it just gave us a, 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 a megaphone yes. to, to, yeah, a, me a megaphone yeah. to um, scream out to the world, look, enough is enough. Enough is enough and we're just not going to take it anymore. Um, and it also provided us a place where, where we can organize, where we can network, uh, where we can um, share ideas, where we forced America as well as the world to have conversations that they were um, uncomfortable or afraid to have. Um, so, um, the, the personally, the reason why I got involved with Occupy Wall Street is because I, I believe that we have no other choice. <laughs> we, we don't have any other choice. This is this is this is this is this is where we make our stand. And it's going to be a long process, but we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. As the young man just said, it's going to be a long process, but we've got to start somewhere. Also, uh, he said that the people just aren't going to take it anymore, which, of course, I'm sure brought that scene from the movie Network to your mind. You know the one? Uh, it's where that newscaster completely lost it and said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, uh, life has now imitated art once again, because a guy named Dylan Radigan, who hosts an American television show dealing with finance and politics, had a major meltdown that was uh, equally entertaining as the one in the movie was. And uh, for your listening pleasure right now, I'm going to play uh, a clip of that meltdown. And as you're listening to it, uh, keep in mind that this guy is a big-time financial pundit on a corporate network that is owned by the 1%. Uh, the clip's on YouTube also, and you may want to take a look at it there because uh, it's not only funny in uh, some sort of perverse black humor kind of way, it's uh, also quite interesting to see the expression on the faces of the other people sitting around the table while he uh, kind of went off like this. Uh, here it is. We owe seventy trillion dollars. I understand that, but don't you, you to walk out a four trillion dollar solution, I, okay, I, which is basically just a way for the Democrats to avoid dealing with this until twenty seventeen. I'm not here to talk about plans to deal with this till twenty seventeen. I'm saying we've got a real problem, and I'm tired of Republicans and Democrats who either want Republicans who want to burn the place to the ground, and Democrats, with all due respect, who want to offer a plan that gets it through the ne their end of their second term of their presidency, and then screws me and my kids okay, when it's over. And until say, we okay. do that we have to deal with the extraction that is at foot it is the reason the financial markets are behaving the way they're behaving that is a mathematical fact I, this is not some opinion this is a mathematical fact tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the united states of america democrats aren't doing it republicans are not doing it an entire integrated system financial system trading system taxing system that was created by both parties over a period of two decades is at work on our entire country right now and we're sitting here arguing about whether we should do the four trillion dollar plan that kicks the can down the road for the president for 2017 or burn the place to the ground both of which are reckless irresponsible and stupid 
And the fact of the matter is, until we actually, and I don't, and I'm sorry to lose my no, temper, no, and get, no, but no. I tell you what, I've been coming on TV for three years doing this. And the fact of the matter is that the re, there's a refusal on both the Democratic and the Republican side of the aisle to acknowledge the mathematical problem, which is that the United States of America is being extracted. It's being extracted through banking, it's being extracted through trade, and it's being extracted through taxation. And there's not a single politician that has stepped forward. Forward, Susan to deal yeah, with this. But there's uh, only one right now. It, the the leader of the free world, whether you like it or not, the but, president of the United States is arguably one of the most powerful individuals we have out there. But and Susan, he's what you're president. saying is exactly the point that Dylan is making. It's no. not about one guy. It's about all no, of them. No, I actually disagree. I think Dylan's saying it is about one guy. What is it one about one guy? What is it about one guy? What is it about one guy? What would you like him to do? I would, like him, to, I would do. like him to go to the people of the United States of America and say, people of the United States of America, your Congress is bought. Your Congress is incapable of making legislation on health care, banking, trade, or taxes, because if they do it, they will lose their political funding, and they won't do it. But I'm the President of the United States, and I won't have a country that is run by a bot Congress. So I'm not going to work with a bot Congress and try to be Mr. Big Guy. I'm working with the bot Congress. I'm going to abandon the bot Congress, like Teddy Roosevelt did, and I'm going to go to the people of the United States, and I'm going to say, you've got a bot Congress. And until we get rid of the bot Congress, which is Jimmy Williams, constant point, which is get the money out of politics, and until a president says that's the problem and says he's going to fix it, there is no policy that I can possibly see, no matter how brilliant your idea may be, or your idea, or my idea, or her idea, or your idea at home, is that idea will not happen as long as there is the capacity to basically fire a politician who disagrees with me by taking funding away from him. Is that a fair assessment? Money in politics is the root of all political evil. It is corruption at its worst. And until we step up and kick that out of the park, it's going to be the same system. All and the only the president could do that. We're going to no, no, no. Guys. Congress has to do it too. The Congress has to do it too. But I'll tell you what. How bad does it have to get? How much money has to be extracted? Know, how many things have to be hurt? The brass tax. Okay, physically, what do you do? For you go and give a speech. Right now. To, yeah, right now. Right now. You say, you say, you and then what happens tomorrow? Tomorrow, what happens is you begin the process of okay. actually investing in solving the problem. So how? I come out and I say, how? I create an infrastructure bank with 2% blending immediately. There's that. Once I explain to people the problem, once I explain to you, you have cancer, the re once you understand how screwed up your trade tax and banking policy, are, believe me, you will have no issue when I incorporate an infrastructure bank that I fund with repatriated offshore money that I bring in and then use to create 2% direct lending to every business in America because when you realize that the banking system is fully corrupt and defrauding us and I come out and say that, which is what I want my president to do, that then at that exact moment I say, you know what, we got a screwed up situation here, people. You all know it, and now what? I'm going to admit it. And as a result, not only have I admitted it, but we're going to begin the process of solving it like grown-ups. They did it in World War II. They did it after the Civil War. They did it in Latin America with the Brady Bonds. We are not seeing it happen now. The panel stays uh, a, a little more emotional than I anticipated getting at <laughs> work this afternoon, but what am I going to do? And I guess I'm getting a little emotional here at work, but what am I going to do? So says a financial pundit. And uh, keep in mind that this guy is only talking about one main issue, finance. But the Occupy movement isn't limited to just that one cause. There are also issues like uh, funding for education, a proper system of health care, race issues, gender issues, sexual orientation issues, and a raft of others. In fact, when you begin to think about all of the things that have gone wrong since the uprising of the 60s, it's very difficult to not get as mad and worked up as that guy that we just heard. However, getting mad and acting violent is exactly what the 1% are hoping for. They know how to deal with violence because, well, they're basically violent people themselves. And that is exactly why it's so important to ensure that every one of these demonstrations remain peaceful on the part of the demonstrators. But rather than me say it, Let's hear what Michael from Occupy Nashville has to say about the difference between terrorists and the Occupy movement. Now I understand that they have a reason to be violent. They've been beaten and shot and bombed and in prison for 75 years now. But um, what they fail to understand is that they lose public sympathy 
Uh, you, you lose public sympathy when you do an act of terrorism. So terrorism is a stupid idea. Violence is a stupid idea. Um, when, uh, however, when the cameras see uh, people being beaten who are not being violent, who are not fighting back, um, it goes around the world instantly. And that's what happened here two nights ago, three nights ago. The camera saw, the news camera saw people who were clearly not going to lift a finger to defend themselves if they were, had been attacked by the police. And they were still arrested and ripped kind of violently apart from each other. And those images were very moving. And they went global. And uh, the reason they went global is because they are so compelling. Because the people don't look like they have the any desire to be violent. But uh, when the check. police gather and we're standing there going, Ah, fucking pigs! Okay, well, that is a threat. So we shouldn't do that. We should be hollering out, Hey, you're us, come and join us. Don't attack us. We're just like you. And this, this will disarm them. We had, we had a, several state troopers break down in tears during, before, and after the arrests. Several were sent home, deemed incapable of uh, exercising the, the order they were given. Um, now, that's an important thing to note. When the, when the people who are told to attack you can't bring themselves to do it because they don't see you as a threat, that's good. That means we're winning. That's how we win. That's how Gandhi won. That's how Martin Luther King Jr. won. That's how Nelson Mandela won. That's how these great struggles are won. And that's something that we need to uh, begin to spread to the other, our brothers and sisters all across the nation. And I think we need to teach happen. the techniques on how to present yourself in a manner that it is completely understood without any shadow of a doubt that you will not be violent. Then if they do attack, watch it spread across the nation. Watch it spread across the globe. Watch those images go all over the world and into people's hearts and minds. And watch the swell of support grow. That's how we do it. That's how it's done. That's how it's always been done when it's successful. Oh, you brought out the heavier. You know? Oh, I mean, <laughs> if, if you fancy yourself an army, you got to ask yourself, where's your guns? Where's your bomber planes? Where's your tanks? If you don't have these things, you're not an army. So don't try and be like one. Don't try and be like one. Be a movement. A movement that doesn't believe in violence. A movement that believes it can achieve without violence. A movement that knows it can change the world without lifting a hand in violence. That's how we win. That's how we win. A lot of people worry about agent provocateurs, people infiltrating your group, trying to steer it off message, trying to bring a violent element into the group. Don't worry about them. Invite them. Be open with everything you do. Transparency is what we're fighting for in our government, so we must also be transparent. We have no secrets. We are an open book for them to come and read because we want them to know us. We want them to understand us. See, because we are moral. We are correct. And we will win. Join us. All right. And we will win. Join us. So says Michael from Occupy Nashville. And I happen to think that he is completely correct in his assessment that if this movement continues to remain nonviolent, that ultimately it can't be turned back. Now, uh, here are some comments from several people at the Occupy Minnesota demonstration this past weekend. In this country, you know, no one wants to be, you know, admit that they're a part of the loser class, even though the loser class, you know, would be is a solid 80% of the country in terms of their uh, income growth, in terms of their net wealth, and in terms of their uh, 
their uh, life security. So I think it, uh, that's that's my concern. That's what I'm, I, you know, just by being out here, you know, contributing another body, you know, showing, you know, just to make, you know, people feel like, you know, you know, there's a lot more of us than uh, than you might think, and that they're not alone. Show up, get down here, do something. Uh, you're not on your own. You know, most of us are suffering, and the powers that be would sure like us to feel like we're all isolated and it's just our own fault. That's what they tell us. It's your own fault. That Kane guy was just saying that, wasn't he? If you're poor or you're not rich, blame yourself. Again, pardon my French. Asshole. <laughs> Um, you can just, that, right? Yeah, yeah. That's no, fine. <laughs> get out there. Get down here. Do something. Get involved in the party politics. Hell, show up at the Republican Party politics. Help change that party. Do something. Turn the damn TV off. Turn the damn internet off. Sorry, now I'm, now I'm for sure not going to get on. Get out and do something. Um, yeah. Well, we need more and more people to get together. Like I say, black. White. I'm going to put it to you this way. If the, if the government can keep us separated, this is, like, this is like my fingers. If I hit you like this, I might knock you back. But if I bring the fingers like this and ball them up and come together and hit you, I have to stand a chance of knocking you out. So that's what I'm saying. Black and white people, everybody, we got to come together as one. Like this, this fist, we got to come together as one. As long as they keep us separated and going against each other and putting us against each other, we'll, we'll ma remain weak like we are. Weak. We got to come together as one. I guess my message is just to keep an open mind and just put yourself in everyone else's shoes and see what's really happening in the world. Develop your opinion not off what you see with one facet. Look at all the facets, study them all, and then decide what you want to believe. As that young man just said, don't just follow this movement on the internet. Get out there yourself. And by that I don't mean that you have to go downtown and camp out for the next two years. There are all kinds of opportunities to spend an hour or two on a street corner demonstration near where you live. And if there isn't anything close by, well, start it yourself. Last Saturday, my wife and I went to the Occupy Encinitas demonstration, which was only a few miles from where we live. It wasn't a huge gathering, uh, maybe about a hundred people at its peak, I'd guess. But I'm sure it made a difference because, not to mention the two short marches that we made through the downtown area, what was most amazing to me was the support from people and cars going by the busy corner that we were standing on. I'd say that, uh, well, maybe about one in every four or five cars would honk or give a thumbs up. And if you've ever demonstrated on a corner like that before, well, you know that's an unusually high percentage of support from people passing by. But the real importance of doing something like that is that all those people who drove by without a clue about what we were standing there for, well, by that evening my bet is that the majority of them are now paying some attention to this issue when it flies by in the mainstream media. It's all about awareness. Another interesting thing that I noticed while standing there with a group of people that spanned all ages and all walks of life, from the unemployed new graduate to the retired corporate attorney to the union man. Well, standing there with them, we all noticed that in many of the cars that went by, there were young children in the back seats who, very furtively at least in the cars that didn't honk, were flashing the peace sign and waving to us. Apparently, these kids know a lot more about what's going on than their parents do, or will at least admit. Now I want you to hear just a brief bit from Dwayne, who is one of the new celebrity webcasters on one of the New York live stream channels. Uh, Dwayne does a late night show and interacts with the people in the chat room. Uh, even late at night there are always 300 or more people there, and yet this thing has the feeling of a small, intimate conversation with a young man freezing his butt off under a tarp in Liberty Park in New York City. Uh, so here's Dwayne. On mainstream is poison, 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 poison. And they only, on, on mainstream media outlets, you know what they talk about? They talk about the police. They talk about, uh, you know, the people that are out here. They talk about the cold weather and they're still here. Not the message. They don't talk about the issues. Why are we here? You know, they don't talk about 
who's behind this. They don't talk about the wars that we're still fighting. They don't talk about, you know, people losing their houses. They don't talk about the people who are sleeping on the streets. They don't talk about the police dropping off homeless people here. They don't talk about the police dropping off drug addicts and, you know, drug dealers here in the park. They don't talk about that. You know, so we need to take as people. Has that been videoed? Is that actually? We have witnesses. We have plenty of witnesses. And Rikers Island stop when they take the red laws two blocks away. So if they're coming here, you guys have everybody's got a camera. Everybody's yeah, got a cell phone. Everybody. That's what we do. We document. Mm -hmm. you document everything. Mm -hmm. We try to document as much as we can. And tell them about the, the guy who and climbed up the scaffolding. You're creating your own media. Yes. You don't need regular media. You care about that's, regular that's media. Correct. That's correct. No, we do not care at all about We do not need the regular media to get this out at all. We are creating our own media. We use social media. We use live stream. We use YouTube. And that's where people are getting objective journalism. That's where people are going to find the truth out. Not through these pundit lapdogs that they call the mainstream media. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Puppets. Puppets. Now you got a CNN this morning was condescending. I'm going to be very blunt with you. They were condescending. Some guy wrote, you have no leaders. You're going to be inept. You don't have a, a core thing and you're going to dissipate what? and fade away because you don't have any. Because we don't have any demands. Any leader in any which way. And that'll, they just that'll don't want to acknowledge our demands. They won't acknowledge no, them. No, no. You know why we don't have demands? Because we don't need nothing from anybody yeah, else. Yeah, that's right. You know, eventually this thing right here is going to be self-sustained. When you put this in, a, in an area where you can grow your own crops, where you can grow your own food, this is self-sustaining. You can even have people come out here and build and, and knit sweaters. Terrorists have the man. <laughs> that's right. That's a very good quote. Because I always felt in my heart that a change needs to be made. You know, I've been part of this struggle almost my whole life. You know? Struggling at home, struggling with, you know, we struggle to eat food sometimes, you know, I've been homeless. At 16 years old, my parents were foreclosed on. You know, my father's been unemployed since then. You know, my father hasn't had a real job since we left New York, or we left Virginia, and I was about 12 years old. You know, he's been job here, job there, and he's a, a licensed contractor. You know, a, a licensed electrician. You know? What did this do you and your cut? Why? Go try to get some job around the Wall Street, get some no, not at all. Yeah, because I, I'm passionate about helping people. I'm passionate about, you know, inspiring something in somebody else because that's what happened to me. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. About like, I'm, as an artist, you know, I had my own uh, inspirations as a kid. You know, poets and, and writers and like, actors and, and whatever it may be. I was inspired and in my heart that blossomed something beautiful. And I always, my entire life since that happened, I wanted to do the same for somebody else, whether it be jumping in front of a bus or, you know, just inspiring with the word. You know, so whatever, that's why I'm here because it's, has, it opens a door and an opportunity for me to come out and help somebody, speak up, say something. As Dwayne just said, we've all got to speak up to say something. And someone who has been speaking up for many, many years now and who had an awful lot to do with everything that is now underway, including the uh, coining of the powerful phrase, we are the 99%, is the anthropologist and author of the important new book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, David Graeber. And I'll try to remember to put up some links to his work when I post the program notes for this podcast. Uh, now, I don't have any audio clips of David Graeber speaking, but I would like to read just a few lines from a recent essay he wrote for The Guardian. We are watching the beginnings of the defiant self-assertion of a new generation of Americans, a generation who are looking forward to finishing their education with no jobs, no future but still saddled with enormous and unforgivable debt. Most, I found, were of working class or otherwise modest backgrounds. Kids who did exactly what they were told they should. Studied, got into college, and are now not just being punished for it, but humiliated, faced with a life of being treated as deadbeats, moral reprobates. Is it really surprising that they would like to have a word with the financial magnates who stole their future? Everything we'd been told for the last decade turned out to be a lie. Markets did not run themselves. Creators of financial instruments were not infallible geniuses. And debts did not really need to be repaid. In fact, money itself was revealed to be a political instrument, 
trillions of dollars of which could be whisked in or out of existence overnight if governments or central banks required it. When the history is finally written, though, it's likely that all of this tumult, beginning with Arab Spring, will be remembered as the opening salvo in a wave of negotiations over the dissolution of the American Empire. Thirty years of relentless prioritizing of propaganda over substance and snuffing out anything that might look like a political basis for opposition might make the prospects for the young protesters look bleak. And it's clear that the rich are determined to seize as large a share of the spoils as remain, tossing a whole generation of young people to the wolves in order to do so. But history is not on their side. And uh, so if you're still here with me, I've got one more clip to play for you. It's a bit longer than the others, but it's uh, by a very inspiring speaker, Michael Moore. And here he is speaking at Occupy San Francisco this past weekend. But, you know, but listen, this is the beauty of this movement. It really doesn't need the Jerry Browns or the Naomi Klein's or really the Michael Moores. I, 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 in fact, I've spent the last 20 years making movies about corporate America and Wall Street. I've, I've occupied it before it was occupied. I was, I was, I, I was arrested there. I was arrested there with Rage Against the Machine about 10 years ago. And I'll tell you, this is a hell of a lot better than just me and four guys in a rock band trying to get arrested when it's happening all over the country. It's so huge, and the police forces don't know what to do about it because the people outnumber their force, their violent force. Can't stop. I was over in Oakland yesterday. The police have backed down. The police are nowhere to be found. The people won. The people stood up. You see, what they were hoping for after Wednesday night was that no one would come back Thursday night. That's what they were counting on. But everybody came back. Plus some. And they came back in larger numbers on Friday. Journal, 
the support of 59% of the American people. If, if you're my age or older, you remember other movements, the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the hippie movement, the hippie movement. <laughs> And anything else that emanated from San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. But did we have 59% of support for the American people in the sixth week of the movement? No! no. Yeah. This is years it took. Yeah. Years! Yeah. You know, it, with, just with gay rights, last month the, was the very first national poll. Very first time the majority of Americans, 54%, said they believe that gay marriage should be the law of the land. The majority of Americans, but how long did that take? Too long. Too long. Oh. This movement in six weeks, 59% say they agree with the aims and goals of this movement. And yet the media keeps asking the question, what are your aims? What are your goals? I think it's quite clear by the name, Occupy Wall Street. Period. And if you need a definition of that, it means we, the people, want to occupy the economy that is ours. Yeah. This is a democracy. Yeah. It's as simple as that. We're demanding democracy. This is our democracy movement. And I want to just say something here and give some credit to somebody, because people, they keep asking again, well, who started this? Who they, who's the instigator of this? You know, and I say, first of all, we're all instigators. Yeah. And there are no leaders because we're all the leaders of this movement. Yeah. And there's no spokesperson. We're all spokespeople. Yeah. Anybody here can speak at the General Assembly. Yes. Right? Yes. So. That's the truth.
friends. Uh, in, I, in conclusion, I'm now I'm I'm, I'm going to head over to actually to out to Grass Valley because I'm trying to also go to these small towns where this is happening and support their efforts. Uh, I'm going to go out to Nevada County uh, because if it's happening there, you know it's happening everywhere. You're not alone. And and if people ask you, well, what is what has this accomplished, Occupy SM? What has this accomplished? It's already had some incredible victories. Victory number one, it has killed despair. Despair that so many Americans have felt. So many people thinking there's no way out of this. I'm or I'm alone, or it's just me and a few friends. Now they've seen across the country that they're not alone, that they are in fact in the majority. This movement has eliminated that feeling of despair. The second thing it's done, it has killed apathy. It has killed apathy. There are so many people who haven't been involved, who've just been sitting at home, angry and upset, but figuring, what can I do? A question that should never be asked in a democracy. What can I do? In the sense of, in other words, there's nothing I can do. That is over. That is over. People, every week this thing builds. Everything, it, every week it grows. Because people are coming out of that place of apathy. The third thing that this has done is it has changed the national discussion. They don't talk about the debt ceiling anymore, do they? No. Or the deficit. No. That was just six weeks ago. That's what they were talking about six weeks ago. That's gone now, isn't it? This is what they're talking about. Yeah. It's just of this. That is what they're talking about. You help to change that. So, remember, this is just the infancy of this movement. And remember, too, that it's it's good that it's not, quote, organized. I think that's been its success, in fact. So, beware of any group or individuals who want to co-opt this or turn it into a left tea party. Don't compare us to the Tea Party. That's something funded by the Koch brothers. All right? This is this is supported by the majority of the American people. Never forget that. So, I know we're in the in a, a general assembly here, and we need to let other people speak. Everybody in this park has a story to tell. And I tell this to the media who are here. Everybody here has a story about what it's like not to have health insurance, what it's like not to have a job, or to have a job, but to be told that you have to take less money. Um, People in this park know what it's like to have their house underwater. Uh, Students here know what it's like to be in debt at the age of 22 in hock for the next 20 plus years of their lives. No other civilized country does that to their young people. In other countries, they make sure they can afford to go to college. And in many countries, such as France, they don't pay to go to college. And it doesn't matter in France whether you go to a trade school or the Sorbonne. You go for free. You go for free. Why is that? I mean, you have to pay for your books. And there's a few fees. In fact, they will have demonstrations over you know, a fee raise of 20 euros. Um, But why do the French do that? Are they better than us? I don't think so. I mean, it's human beings, right? We're all human beings. We're all basically good at our core. So why do the French do this? They do it. They do it because they want to live in a society that's not only civilized, that not only treats each other well, but a society that can get better. You can't get better if you have an uneducated country. If you have a lousy education, things will not advance and get better. We will not fix the things we need to fix if we keep a population ignorant and stupid. Forty million functional illiterate adults works in the benefit of those who are in charge of this country. And this must be stopped. Uh, to say this before I head out into the Republican territory of California. 
And yet yeah, Flint is occupied and has, and has been occupied for a long time. Um, but uh, but keep this up. Don't despair. Know that tens of millions are with you, and make this thing grow. Do not stop. Do not relent. When they when they ask you why aren't you in Sacramento occupying or why aren't you in D.C. occupying, the answer is because we. <laughs> Somebody shot him because we live here. <laughs> <laughs> it's because the, the California corporations that are headquartered here in San Francisco, they call the shots for Sacramento. Why waste your time right now in Sacramento talking to the servants of their masters? You're here. You're here. You're here. You're here. Well, it's uh, kind of hard to top that talk right now, particularly since this podcast is uh, way over time as it is. So I'm going to save the comments sent in by fellow saloners Mike K., Andrew, and Local Man. Uh, I'm going to save them for my next podcast, and hopefully you will add your voice to that mix as well by sending either an email message or a short audio message in MP3 format to Lorenzo at OccupySalon.us. And instead of playing so many sound bites from the video streams that are coming out from the Occupy sites, I'll first focus on what our fellow saloners are saying about the times we are now living in. And uh, by the way, thanks to fellow podcaster Joe Metheny of the G Spot Podcast, my next few programs are going to feature the one and only Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, I haven't heard these talks yet myself, and so they'll be coming out soon since I can hardly wait to hear them. Well, that's going to do it for now, and so I'll close once again by saying that uh, this podcast and most of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. And if you have any questions about that, just uh, click the Creative Commons link at the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can get to via psychedelicsalon.us. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends, and I want to leave you with a song. As I see it, this isn't a revolution that's taking place, it's an evolution. You know, revolutions are often violent and seldom do more than replace one set of one percenters uh, with another batch of them. Whereas in this ongoing evolution that is now underway, well, we aren't just changing the officers on the bridge of the Titanic, We're jumping ship and searching for an entirely new vessel to carry us across the oceans of the future. And, in my opinion, every good evolution needs some good music. And this tune I first heard in my friend Lefty's podcast number 121 from Lefty's Lounge on the Cannabis Podcast Network at dopefiend.co.uk. It's by Twisted Sister and it's called We're Not Gonna Take It, which may be a perfect anthem for these times.
there's an Irish prayer, may you be alive at the end of the world, and meaning may you be a part of the transformation of transformation, which gives everything meaning. So I'm not saying follow me, I'm saying we all have to respond in some way to this legacy, this responsibility, and this challenge. You know, there's an Irish prayer, may you be alive at the end of the world, and meaning may you be a part of the transformation of transformations, which gives everything meaning. So I'm not saying follow me, I'm saying we all have to respond in some way to this legacy, this responsibility, and this challenge.